Hi everybody, hope everybody's doing well. Let's do our last spinal anatomy lecture before the midterm. All right, we had embryology, that was this week. Spinal anatomy will be next week, a week from today actually, next Wednesday. Uh, short lecture today, so I'm not gonna won't pile a ton of material on you. Let's just finish the thoracic spine. Uh, we won't start biomechanics or the cervical spine. I haven't decided which way we're going yet. But let's just, we'll end it right here. Here we go. So we were, where were we talking about? We just finished talking about costal margin last time. All right, and we started talking a little bit about ribs, but uh, we're going to dig into the ribs now. Uh, so that's where we are. There's... Uh, Costal facets, we need to, that makes the thoracic spine quite unique, doesn't it? A typical thoracic vertebrae has four small half circle facets on them called costal facets or costal demi facets. The word demi means half, right? So it's a half. Sometimes they're not so half though. Sometimes they look pretty big to me. Uh, but there are four of them, two on each side of the lumbar vertebrae. We'll see those. I think we saw them last time too. Specifically, there's a superior and inferior one. And uh, yeah, and these fa these facets have mates on the rib heads. We'll look specifically at rib heads in a minute, and that's what they connect to. There's also a transverse costal facet as well. We'll look at that as well. Uh, so here is kind of a classic picture of a superior costal demi facet, inferior costal demi facet, and there is just a transverse costal facet. And not all vertebrae have these costal tr or these transverse costal facets, do they? Uh, most ribs, T1 through T9, connect the vertebrae at three, or connect to the vertebrae at three articulation points via three facets. Uh, there's an inferior costal facet and a superior costal facet and transverse costal facet. T1 is a little bit strange. It's got a gigantic, if this was T1, it would have a very large facet here because the rib head doesn't have to share. It doesn't have to share it with anybody. Nevertheless, it still has three on it. Right. Now here's an important thing, the superior, what rib connects to this, the superior costal facet? That's always the rib with the same number. So if, if this is T4 or T6, this would be the T6 rib coming in like this. Right, but, but the rib's gonna be big, it's gonna spill over and connect to the one above. I think I got a slide. We'll go up above and uh, show you. But the costal, or the transverse costal facet also has the same number rib connected. So it's really easy. Whenever you look at that or that and wonder which rib it is, all you have to do is know the name of that vertebrae and that tells you which rib it is. It does connect to the bone above too, uh, which makes it sometimes confusing. Okay, here's that image I shot. And it, you can clearly see, and we talked about last time, is this a upper thoracic, a middle thoracic, or a lower thoracic? Or how do you know it's even a thoracic? Well, let's answer the first question. It's definitely a middle thoracic vertebrae because it's got that very vertical running spinous process here. And it's definitely a thor thoracic vertebrae because it's got these facets, right? Those are the three uh, articular surfaces. All right, these are demi, so, uh, and that's the transverse cost of a set. And these are superior demi facet. Yeah, superior costal demi, I always forget costal. Superior costal demi facet, inferior costal demi facet, and transverse costal facet. What was what else was weird about thoracic vertebrae? What's strange about them? So they have a big notch right there, inferior vertebral notch. 
they have no vertebral notch up here. So very strange. All right, so there they are, labeled for you. Now, this is always, look at all the stars here. You're always going to get a question or two on this. Which rib connects to which vertebral body and which transverse process? I kind of told you already, but the superior costal demi-facet, I need to add costal in, a costal in there. But the superior demi-facet, costal demi-facet, that always connects to the same number rib. Superior demi-facet, superior costal demi-facet connects with the S for same number, right? So I just explained that to you. Inferior costal demi-facet, let, let me actually make a number. Probably put should put costal back in there on slide 46. Add costal. Um, so the inferior demi-facet always connects to one up. So uh, inferior means increase by one. So if you're looking at the inferior costal demi facet of T5, increase by one, and that'll tell you the rib. So that would be the T6 rib that connects to the inferior costal demi facet. Okay, the transverse costal facet again always attaches to its own rib. Here's a nice kind of a see-through drawing where you can see. Here's the T7 rib, right? There's the T7 vertebrae, T6 vertebrae. Here's the superior costal demi facet down here. You can see through. Uh, that's connecting to its own. Same. Superior costal facet, superior costal demi facet is same. So that's T7 property. But see how it also connects to T6. So if you're at this, if you're looking at this inferior costal demi facet, you have to increase the rib by one. You don't say that's the T6 rib, it's got to be the T7. See how that works? And then the transverse costal facet, um, that's always the same as well. So that's the C7, C, or T7 uh, TP transverse process, and that's the T7 rib. Pretty good. See how that works? Okay, two new diarthroidal joints are created. So, right, we just created two two new joints. So these are just like, or by the way, what's that? Let's draw the capsule around that. Good, that's a Z joint, zygopothecia joint or facet joint. When you get out in the real world, it's called the facet joint. When you're in school, it's still a zygopothecial joint. Uh, but that's a true diarthroidal joint. It has a capsule around it. It has a synovial membrane, in fact a thick synovial membrane that folds inside of it and it can get pinched. These are exactly the same. They have capsules around them and they have a synovium inside them and they can get stuck and pinched and cause pain in patients as well. All three of these are true diarthroidal joints. Okay, so pretty cool. So we better name them. So we have just created, now why do Kramer doesn't call this the costal vertebral? I don't know. Other oh, books, Stan Ring calls it costal vertebral. Uh, but he does call it costal corporal. Corporal means body. Uh, so I guess it's a little more specific. So that's what I'm going to go with. But just be aware, if they say costal vertebral joint, it's the same thing. And then there's a costal transver uh, transverse joint as well. Uh, collectively, the primary motion is rotation is allowed. Rotation of the rib is allowed at these joints. And there's a slight glide involved. We'll do the biomechanics very soon, if not next. You'll understand what gliding is. Um, but there's a upward and downward rotation, and there's some superior and inferior glide that goes on at the joint. Uh, but there's not very much because, well, there's a nest of ligaments that we have to look at, and those ligaments are very hampering, so not much motion. Uh, ribs 7 through 10 have a little bit more glide than the ribs above uh, because the transverse, costal transverse facets 
are a little bit more flat, and therefore the flatter a, a joint is, the more slip that can occur, more translation can occur over there. Let's take a look at some of the atypical thoracic vertebrae and how they connect to ribs. Uh, so T1 is a little strange. I think, I'm not sure if we talked about this, but it usually has a full costal facet, not a demi facet, but a full costal facet on the superior portion of the vertebral body. Uh, why is it so big? Because T1 usually doesn't share. It doesn't share with C7. Um, therefore, it's a full facet there. But it does have its own inferior costal demi facet below because the T2 rib connects, half of it connects to T1, the other half connects to T2. Okay, that's the deal there. Every now and then you get a demi facet up here, a superior costal demi facet, because every time, every now and then you get a, a inferior costal demi facet on C7, so the rib can share between the twos. So that's not super unusual. Now let's jump all the way down to T12. This only has one costal facet, and for articulation, with the rib head, the whole rib, the facet of the rib head. So T12 doesn't share. And another interesting thing is the T12 rib, remember we called that a what? Floating rib. Why? Because it doesn't have any transverse costal facet. Uh, so the T12 rib only connects uh, to that, that facet on the body and nothing else. There's no connection to the transverse process. There's no connection to the sternum either, so it's a floating rib. So that's a little bit weird about 12. Uh, 11, kind of the same deal. It has a single costal facet for articulation with the T11 rib. It's full, the T11 rib. We'll look at rib heads in a minute, uh, but it doesn't share. Um, so it also has no costal facet. So therefore, a good, easy softball board question, what, what two vertebrae in the body only have a single costal facet normally? And that would be T11 and T12, right? And neither one of those have a transverse costal facet either. See how that works? Okay. What about T10? Typically, uh, it has only a single costal facet as well, so it's very similar to T11, but this one's a little more variable. Sometimes T11 has a demi facet, superior costal demi facet, because that T T10 rib sometimes doesn't share, or sometimes shares between T10 and T9. Uh, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. All right, so it might have two articular, if that T10 rib has two articular facets on it, uh, then T10 will, to, to meet, to accommodate that, it'll have a superior costal demi facet because T9 is also going to have to have an inferior costal demi facet to share that rib head's double articular pads on the rib head. Okay. Uh, let's see, in this case, T, yeah, we said that. So transverse costal facet uh, may or may not, about 50-50 chance it may or may, about, may or may not be there. So it's kind of, kind of iffy. T10 is highly variable, I guess you could say. What about T9? Uh, well, when T9, uh, when the 10th rib does not articulate, with the T9 ver, uh, verte vertebral body at all, when the when the when the T10 rib is a full has only one articular facet, then there will be no inferior costal demi facet. But if it does, then if the T10 rib does have kind of a double articular pads on it then it will have an inferior costal demi facet. So it all depends on the development of the rib or not. But nevertheless, that's the end of the weirdness right there because it always has a superior costal demi facet. Right? So that's where we go back into the normal.
good with that. Okay, so there is a, what is that, 11? That's a T11. What do you think of that? Well, we know T11, we can, so if I gave you on the test, if I put this bone on the test, and I said this vertebrae most likely represents T blank, uh, it wouldn't be T7, wouldn't be T6, wouldn't be T1, T1 is a might have a big demi facet or a big full costal facet here, but T1 would have a demi facet here. This doesn't. Plus T1 would have a transverse costal facet. This doesn't. Uh, so this could be either T11 or T12. I didn't get deeper into the transverse processes, but T12 doesn't have a very developed transverse process. It has a short little stubby one. So I could tell this is T11, but. I'd be happy if you could uh, you could tell it's T11 or T12. How about let's look at T1? Because I've, I've put these on the test before. All right, so why is this T1? Uh, well, it's got two demi-facets, superior and inferior causal demi-facet, but look how big this one is. This is a normal half demi facet. So this really can only be T1. Although in reality, we just saw a picture in the slide presentation of a bone that really had a full costal facet and it wasn't, it wasn't T1. But nevertheless, for our purposes, we're not gonna use the weird ones. How about this T10, do you agree with that? Could that be T10? Could it? Yeah, it could be. Uh, so it's got demi facet here. So that means uh, that's not demi. That's a full facet there. So that means the T10 in this patient, the T10 rib head only has one facet. So it's not sharing with T9. So that could be T10. All right. And so here's a T11 vertebra, a real one. And you can see the big, gigantic, full costal facet here. Do you see a demi facet or do you see a costal facet, costal transverse facet? Nope, I do not. What would I, what if I labeled that? What's that? Number one. Don't say inferior articular process. That's the facet of the inferior, that's the articular surface of the inferior articular process. If I put back here, this will help you with your lab. If I put it back here, that's the inferior articular process. What if I put number three here? Superior articular process, what if number four right here? That's the facet of the superior articular process. And then what, what vertebrae do you think this is? I kind of gave it away, didn't I? Well, there's no costal transverse costal facet. There's a giant one here, so probably, for your purposes, could be T12, could be a T11, maybe even T10. See how that works. All right, meet the ribs. So typical rib we'll talk about. I'm not going to talk too much about the atypical ribs. Uh, but the typical ones we will. It consists of several parts. There is a curved shaft uh, with an anterior and posterior end. Now this always gets confusing. I might as well cover this right now. So here's vertebrae. This is a posterior to anterior view. Draw a couple of vertebrae. Right? And we have a TP coming out like this on each side. Right. And let's Maybe get a different color here. Now we have a rib. So here's the point of this wonderful drawing. So the rib is going to come like this, and it's going to wrap into the plane of the page. We're going to go anterior to the sternum to connect. So I am moving distally. This is distal. So the anterior part of the rib is distal. 
the posterior part of the rib is proximal. Okay, we good with that? All right. Uh, so that's a typical kind of a deal there. Uh, the anterior end ends in something called costal cartilage. The rib doesn't connect right into the sternum. There's a kind of in-between tissue made of cartilage. It's called costal cartilage. It's also quite flat, so you can always tell the which end is the anterior end and which end is the posterior end. Uh, the posterior end has several pieces. The rib head I talked about already quite a bit. It has a rib head, a neck, and a tubercle. A tubercle has a nice facet on it, as we'll see. As you approach, as you approach, as you move proximally on the rib, you get a really sharp bend, and that bend is going to be called the angle. All right, let's take a look at some of this stuff in real life here. So here's a human, real human rib. And tell me which is the anterior end while well, I take some water here. You got it. I said the anterior end is flat. Which end is flat? That's way flatter. Okay, so that's the anterior end, posterior end. This whole thing is called the rib shaft. Up to right about here. That's the rib shaft. The rib shaft runs all the way up here. There's, there's a connection for the costal cartilage on the other end of that. We can't see it. There's a little facet for that. But here we got some stuff. There's a big bump. So that's the rib tubercle. This is the rib head, another bump. We'll look at the two articular pads on this. And then this is called the neck, this region right in here. And then you can also see the rib. See where it bends really sharply? Kind of get a nice sharp bend right there. Um, that's called the angle of the rib. Okay. So again, there's the anterior end, posterior end, tubercle. Should have moved the arrow a little more, but this is tubercle. The angle is right here. There's no one spot, but it's about where the rib bends the most. Neck is smooth. We're going to look at ligaments that connect to that neck. And then the head. Good. You'll talk about rib heads being out, and uh, they can be out. There's, there's all sorts of joints right there need to talk about. So we'll start with the rib head. This is the proximal end of the rib or the posterior end, whichever you want to say. It articulates uh, with two adjacent vertebral bodies. We've talked about that. The, the most ribs, not all of them do. Sometimes it like t the rib 12 and rib 11 and even rib 10, they connect with just one body. So they only have one Costal demi or costal facet, but run of the mill. Most of them are, have are double have two articular pads on them. Why do they have two articular pads? Because they connect to two uh, two bodies, two costal demi facets. Is what they connect with. A demi facets match the superior and inferior articular facets uh, on each rib head. We'll see how that works in a second. There is also, so here let's just draw a rib head here, kind of looking straight down, then the rib would kind of go off like that. So there's a nice pad right here. So that's an articular pad, and there's another articular pad or articular facet. And then in between them we have a ridge, a crest, a crest of bone, which is called the crest of the rib head. We'll learn that this actually has, is attached kind of indirectly to the intervertebral disc, which is a really weird setup. Uh, but that's what the rib head looks like. All right, let's look at a better picture than mine. So here's the tubercle region. I mean, they can include this. They probably should have said from about here to here is the tubercle. This region between here and here would be the neck. The drawing's a little messed up. Okay, neck is, doesn't do anything exciting, doesn't articulate, but that's where some uh, two or three ligaments that connect there we'll talk about. 
not sure how, I can't remember how deep I went into it. Okay, but here's the crest that I just drew. Okay, so here's the superior articular facet. Guess who that connects to? Uh, that would connect to the that would connect to the inferior costal or inferior costal demi facet. So that's a little weird. I'm just going to call these. I'm getting too specific here. Uh, let's just call these just facets. There's two facets on the rib heads. We won't because that's going to get too confusing. I think that's getting too deep. Definitely know what the crest is, though. If you got one of these double faceted rib heads, it's going to have a crest in between. And then we're going to look at a ligament that comes out and actually attaches to the inner vertebral disc. Gives a little support. Disc herniations in the thoracic spine are really rare. Uh, well, they happen, but symptomatic ones are quite rare uh, because there's so much extra stuff uh, connecting to those discs, especially laterally. All right. Make a note about 63. I think it's getting too deep. Too deep. All right, now here's just another real one. There's the neck. What, and you can see the tubercle looks a lot better in this real one. There's the head of the rib. The neck of the rib is located between the head and the tubercle of the rib. It's the attachment point for two ligaments, key ligaments, the costal transverse ligament, and then the superior costal transverse ligament. There's actually two bands, an anterior and posterior band uh, of this. That's why I was saying there's three ligaments. I don't know, that might be getting too deep, though. So really, technically, there's three ligaments that connect there, uh, but one of them is double-banded. You'd have to read how the question was. Uh, then the tubercle, we talked about that. It's a process that forms on the lateral boundary of the neck, right at the beginning of the shaft. Okay, we've seen that. It has an articular facet as well, and that one articulates with the transverse costal facet. Okay, uh, the same number, in fact. So how would you name that? If I stuck a pin on this, what if I put... Number two right here, you can see the facet. Actually, the facet is on the other side. But if it's on the smooth surface, the facet or articular facet, uh, then you would have to say the articular facet of the rib tubercle. Don't forget of the. Also contains a non-articular part, which gives rise to a very short and powerful muscle or ligament called the lateral costal transverse ligament. Shaft, okay, so shaft begins immediately distal to the articular tubercle. Where was that again? So there's the articular tubercle, so the shaft would start right here. And there's the shaft. Good, tubercle, neck, head of the rib. All right. And extends distally all the way to the anterior rib where it meets the costal cartilage. The shaft includes the angle of the rib. The angle is part of the shaft where it bends. So curvature, we talked about this a little bit. Wait, tell me now, which way's? oh, I, I kind of ruined it. Which way's front? This is flat, so that's always front. Flat, F for front or anterior. You can see the angle quite nicely. There's no sharp curves until you get right in this region here. So that's the angle right there. So ribs typically curve inferiorly and anteriorly from proximal to distal. Uh, much of the curve occurs at the angle, as you can see right up above. The angle is located a few centimeters distal from the articular facet. I don't want, uh, really, it's distal, exactly distal from the tubercle. I don't know why Kramer said few centimeters because the tubercle contains the articular facet but that's just the way he decided to say that there okay costal groove is another important one I didn't it's, I always have trouble getting pictures of these they're hard to see so 
it is a groove that's dug into the rib. And you can see it on the rear ribs. I'll have to work on getting a picture for this thing. Uh, but it always tells you it's on the inferior part of each rib. Sometimes it's hard to see. The key that boards and everybody likes is that rib on the back side. You can just see a little bit of the groove here. But there's a neurovascular bundle that rubs that runs in here. In fact, the intercostal neurovascular bundle runs here. And they're always in this order. Uh, from superior to inferior, the mnemonic is van. So there's the intercostal vein on top, the intercostal artery on the, in the middle, and the intercostal nerve uh, down on the very uh, lower part. This is why when you're in medical school, when you put a chest tube in, you never put the chest tube touching the bottom surface of the rib because you could injure the intercostal nerve. You always palpate the rib below and slide the chest tube right down there. And that way, see there's nothing there's nothing on the superior part of the rib to injure. So that's where the chest tube goes, right there. So you don't injure that intercostal nerve. The patient have a horrible burning neuropathy type pain. Right? Have pain burning all the way around his rib because of because of that. All right? Um, if you wanted, some people use the mnemonic NAVE. It's another one. If if you like to go from inferior to superior, intercostal nerve, intercostal artery, intercostal vein. Let me show you another thing while we're here. I do like my anatomy. I don't teach that much anymore, though. I'm just too, got too many classes. And let me get rid of this. Here's another important thing. I find students always confused with this. So this is an A to P view, right? The little man's looking at us. There's the man looking at us. So there's three layers of muscle. Also, when you put that chest tube in, you have to pierce three layers. And then you have to pierce the parietal pleura is the fourth layer down. Um, but nevertheless, there's an external intercostal muscle, which you can see the fibers run more kind of lateral to medial. Underneath that, there's an internal intercostal muscles. Fibers tend to run more the opposite direction. But sometimes it's really hard to tell the internal costal from this. That's the intermost intercostal muscles. So how do you tell the in, internal versus the innermost intercostal muscles? You look for the neurovascular bundle because the neurovascular bundle always runs in between these two muscles. So that's how you can tell where you are. So always look for that when you're in the cadaver lab. You can see that nerve sticking out there, right? So bad to stick a chest tube right there. That little sharp thing that goes in first would destroy that nerve, right? So make sure you find, palpate the superior portion of the rib and put it in there. Chiropractors, of course, are not going to be doing that. Uh, atypical ribs. The first rib is really weird. It's the only one I'm going to really talk about. It is, because we talked about some of the atypicalness of T10, 11, and 12, uh, they don't have a crest. Here's that view of the rib head. They don't have that crest. Uh, if we look at the kind of long end of the rib, they'll just have a giant facet here. And that matches the costal facet on T12, 11, and 10. Uh, but rib 1 is interesting. First of all, well, first of all, it's got a full costal facet. It doesn't have a superior costal demi facet. We said that. But the shape of it is weird. It's very short, and it's very flat, and it's very strong. Uh, it lies almost completely horizontal in the body, which is weird. It's not angled inferiorly like most of the ribs are. And its superior surface actually has a nice muscle attachment for the scaling, uh, the scaling, scalenus anticus, or the anterior scaling muscle. Uh, and that's called the scaling tubercle. So you can always tell the rib. And unfortunately, I left 
I took all of my bones home so I could shoot pictures of them, but I forgot some of the ribs, so I didn't get that one home. I have to show you a picture of it. But here is an A to P view. An A to P view. So again, man's A to P. There's the man. Here's his rib. Here's the sternum right here. So really weird, right? It's not round. Still has an angle right here. Still has a neck. Still has a tubercle. Still has a head. The head's only got one facet on it. It doesn't have a crest on it. And it's got a big bump. And it's usually a pretty good sized bump right there. And that's the scaling tubercle. So you can always tell that first rib. All right, cost of vertebral articulations. So the ribs, as we said, they articulate to the vertebrae. That gives us two new joints. And collectively, those joints are called the costal vertebral joints. Oh, okay, okay, I see, I see. I just, I just, light bulb clicked on with me. Costal vertebral joints is the main category, so that shouldn't be an AKA. So that's Kramer's correct in that. Uh, so it is costal corporal. So the costal vertebral joints have two subcategories, costal corporal, costal transverse. All right, so this, these these are slides are all brand new. So I'm just, I just got this class, what, three quarters ago. So I'm slowly building it up. So let's look at these two articulation. We said they're, they're diarthroidal joints. I need to go back and change that AKA then, don't I? I can't remember where that was, but I'll fix that before I upload these slides. Fix AKA for costal vertebral. All right, let's look at costal corporal. Because corporal, corpus is body, so that's why. Uh, that's where that comes from. Uh, so it's the joint between the rib head facets or facet and the costal facets or facet, depending. Um, but it's, yeah, it's the joint between the vertebral body and the rib head, I could say. It's a true diarthroidal joint. It has a capsule, has a synovial fluid. It even has synovial folds. I said synovial membranes are, f are kind of prominent inside, like the Z joints. Even in these costal corporal articulations, they're quite prominent as well. And they can get pinched and cause pain in people. Actually, that's one thing. Chiropractic is pretty good for people who have these rib misarticulations or subluxations or fixations. Okay, so similar to the Z joint, let's take a look. Here's a overhead view or axial hat or chat, right? Cross-sectional, horizontal, axial, transverse, all AKAs. Drives you crazy, doesn't it? And so this is a cut not through the disc, but cut right through the body. Uh, so you can see the costal vertebral joints right here. So that's the facet of the rib head meeting the costal demi facet here. I'm not sure if it's superior. I think it looks like superior to me. But it's one of the costal demi facets. And then back here you can see kind of a, a different plane. We have the costal transverse joint hooking up with the facet on the rib tubercle uh, to make another costal transverse joint. Okay, and we'll talk about all these ligaments here in a second. So cool, we got two new joints. Now the costal transverse articulations, uh, they're made by, as I just said, the facet on the costal tubercle and the transverse costal facet. These are not seen for sure at T11 and T12. These are also true diarthroidal joints. They have a, canap a capsule, they have synovial fluid, they're the real deal. They have a fold, a synovial fold, just like everything else. All right, almost done. So let's do some ligaments now. And these uh, these are not a lot of fun, I don't think. It gets confusing. But I'll try to make it as painless as possible. 
So they arise, uh, let's talk about this one first. So this is the lateral costal transverse ligament. This is the easy one to start with. It simply arises from the lateral tip of adjacent transverse processes. It's short. It's really stubby. And it connects into the costal tubercle on the adjacent rib. So it arises from the lateral tip of the transverse process. Uh, it courses laterally and joins the non-articular region of the costal tubercle. So this is not can't you can't you hit, it can't join the facet right the facet is already joint to the co the transverse uh, costal process okay so let's take here it is right here picture is better sometime so it arises from the lateral tip of the transverse process and it digs in to the costal tubercle but not the articular portion just the bony portion of the costal tubercle. We good? So that one's pretty easy to see. There's another one, another one, and another one. You can see these on when we had a cadaver, you could see them on the cadaver quite nicely. Next one is the superior costal transverse ligament. This is a double. It has an anterior and posterior laminae. Uh, this course is between the neck of each rib. So it rises from the neck and it inserts into the transverse process of the vertebrae above. So both parts course superiorly from the neck or from the ribs neck to the inferior border of the transverse process immediately above. So if you got a nice picture of these here, you can see these in the lab your lab worksheet for that was yesterday. Um, but yeah, there they are right there. And there's the anterior, posterior laminae. You can't really see posteriors behind this one, um, but that's the superior costal transverse ligament. Okay, accessory ligament. So this is a little ligament. So it also rises from the neck of the rib, just medial to the superior costal transverse ligament. Uh, it anchors the inferior articular process, or anchors into the inferior articular process. So this goes all the way into the into the spine. And this one is important. Let's take a look at it. There's the accessory ligament right here. See the little guy? There's another one right here. Superior costal transverse ligament is outside of it. But look, we got a little hole in there, don't we? Take a wild guess what's coming out of there. Ventral rami is coming out of there. So not only do you have a foramen, but you have a, another little tunnel made by these things. Okay, that's the accessory ligament. So posterior, aka ventral ramus, comes out of there. Remember Kramer, watch out for this. I, I don't like this. Posterior primary division, he calls it. Remember, I said I don't like that because down in the it gets confusing in the uh, lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus. You have the posterior ramus splits into division, anterior and posterior division, so that gets confusing. So Gray's Anatomy, both Gray's Anatomy books uses posterior ramus. So I wish he would stay with that. Nevertheless, because there's some of the neurology books use the same thing. All right, so here's just a blow up. So ventral ramus passes. I didn't draw it, but we could have we could have drew it coming right through here. Kind of like transforaminal ligaments we talked about. Goes right through there. Then there's an interarticular ligament. So this one is the one I said that comes off the crest of the rib head so you have to have a crest so you're not going to have this down at t12 or t11 or probably t10 either uh, because you have to and even t1 um, but if you have a double articular surface with a crest in between then you're going to have an interarticular ligament extending off of that and that thing digs right into the 
intervertebral disc. Did I say that? Yeah. Uh, in the rib to the intervertebral disc. It has two components we're not going to get into. But, I mean, all these ligaments secure these, uh, these connections. Okay, here's an easy one to see. Even on cadavers, you can see it quite nicely. Uh, this is called the radiate ligament because it looks like it's radiating out. It arises from the anterior part of the rib head here, and it just connects into kind of a perimeter around the costal demi facets or costal facets. They all, even the T12 and 11, have it. And you can see it's just kind of digging in there. It starts into the vertebral bodies, surrounds the costal demi facets or costal facets. And some of the fibers dig right into the intervertebral disc as well. So it's another supporting the posterior lateral corners of the disc can be supported. And the anterior lateral, anterior lateral corners can be kind of beefed up with this one as well. Okay, costal transverse ligament. So this is, it's medial to the superior costal transverse ligament. Uh, but it passes from the posterior part of the rib neck again uh, to the anterior proximal portion of the transverse process. So it's a little closer to the vertebral body, still off the transverse process. So here's the costal transverse ligament running right here. Okay, there's another one up here. All right. Remember what this one was? Good, that's the superior costal transverse ligament. Here's an intertransverse ligament. And I should mention that that reminds me. I didn't I'm not going to cover all the other ligaments, but all the other ligaments we talked about in the lumbar spine, they run through the thoracic spine as well. I'm just not going to repeat them. There's an anterior longitudinal ligament. There's a posterior longitudinal ligament. There's a ligamentum flavum. There's an intertransverse ligament. There's a super trans, or I'm sorry, there's a there's a interspinous ligament and a and a supraspinous ligament. Uh, and there's intertransverse ligaments, um, like we just uh, saw right here. Intertransverse ligament. So on top of that, we have all these new ligaments. So these are in addition to. Right, here's just another picture kind of showing uh, the superior costal transverse ligament runs here. This is not the greatest view to look at this, but if you look overhead, you can see the costal transverse ligament here. Uh, lateral call, lateral costal transverse ligament back here. Okay, there's some little, inter, uh, there's the interarticular ligament here. It said we said that connects the crest to the disc, and uh, these are true dorothyroid joints. They're showing the joint cavity. There's a synovium around there, and yeah, real, uh, real joint can cause pain. Has nociceptors in it. I think this one comes from your lab handout, but we'll go through these. Uh, there's the intertransverse ligament. That, nothing special about that. That goes all the way down. Uh, but there's the superior costal transverse ligament here. I guess the other ones are there. The radiate ligament is there. And they cut the lateral costal transverse ligament because we took out the ribs so you can see the, the superior costal demi facet, inferior costal demi facet, and transverse costal facet here. All right, so we'll keep it short. We'll cut it off right there. There's a lot of material in there. You're probably not familiar with this stuff. So, all right, remember, next, we'll start next Tuesday. We will start, uh, we'll probably start biomechanics. I'll, yeah, because I don't want to put them all at the end because we haven't done the cervical spine, which is fun to do, uh, but we've got some other work to do. So we'll probably do biomechanics. We have a little neurology to do as well. Um, but that next Tuesday lecture will not be on your test, which is Wednesday, right? So next Wednesday, uh, week seven is your test. 
All right, see you guys later.